and kick this off. So right out the get-go, this is based on a lot of things that I have learned over the last five years using Fusion 360, as well as the last two years working at Autodesk, seeing customers and how they use Fusion. So the first thing I'm gonna show everybody is right out the get-go is how to change some of your preferences. So a lot of people overlook this from the get-go. If you've ever had Fusion stuck in millimeters or things as simple as which way do you wanna use your mouse control? So if you're somebody that's gonna switch from HSMWorks, SolidWorks user, you could actually default button layout the same exact way. Things like reversing your zoom control, even the center button on your mouse, if you're somebody that wants to do a free orbit versus a constrained orbit, these are all nice things to be able to change out the get-go versus trying to relearn your mouse. Another one that's really good, depending on if you're a designer versus a machinist, Z up versus Y up is something that makes a big difference at the end of the day. Moving a little further on here is under the manufacturer tab. The one that I tell anybody and everybody to actually go about is one, you wanna enable your cloud libraries. This allows you to store your tooling libraries to share them with other people. Another couple that I really like to do is in my browser display, and you'll see this in a little bit, I like to see things like my machining times. So I make sure I turn on all of these options at the end of the day. This is a nice, easy way to go about it. Another one that you can actually get away with, if you're a mill guy, you're always using the milling tab, you could actually set it every time you go to the manufacturer workspace to go directly to the milling tab. Same goes for the other workspaces in the manufacturer tab. Last one down here at the bottom under manufacturer, this is where you could set your default units if you haven't. And one more is the preview features. This is one of my favorite areas. So if you ever have questions about what's coming to Fusion in the future, I always direct people to go look in the manufacturer tab. There's a lot of things you can turn on. This is more or less a beta environment that allows you to see what's coming. It can make your life easier in the now even and see how that works. So one is the in-process stock. Some of you've probably already seen this, the mesh safety checks, the live machine connections, even now what's new in Fusion, the machine simulation and machine builder are put in here. From here, I'm gonna go ahead and transition over to a couple of different things. I kind of like to just jump into what's going on. So let's go ahead and pull out one of my mill parts here. This is a clutch cover to a motorcycle. One of my buddies wanted to swap out the one that he had and he wanted the biohazard sign on it. So we went ahead and made this for him. That being said is when I bring in a part, I actually have the ability to do some inspections on it. One that I really like is accessibility. If I'm a three axis guy, I want to go ahead and look at a part to make sure there's nothing crazy like any undercuts. Any undercuts are going to be shown in red. Yes, this is a very square part, as I like to say. But that being said is anytime there would be undercuts, it shows me easily in red where those undercuts are. If you're a tooling and a mold kind of guy, you may actually want to go out there and do something along the lines, minimum radius analysis to tell you what the smallest tool you have. Another one that we do have is called draft analysis, but that's in the, or the design workspace versus the manufacturer. So right out the get-go on a part like this, some of the tricks that I find myself using a lot of time, if you're not drilling and tapping constantly, you're probably in the world of lathe. But that being said is I actually have a template to make the entire process easier. You have the ability to set up templates on your own. This one here is, I call it as my tap auto hole find. So initially, it just so happens that this is a quarter 20 tap and it's automatically finding my 201 holes that were drilled for quarter 20. In the event that I go into this actual tool path and I switch out from a quarter 20 to a 516, 18, for example, and hit okay, what you're gonna notice is this is automatically finding those tap drill sizes. How does this work at the end of the day? Well, this works Instead of using selected face and the little checkbox that you can use to find the same hole size, I actually wrote out in an expression here. Expressions are an advanced feature of Fusion. This one is very complex at the end of the day. What it's really doing is determining 75% thread engagement and a lower tolerance and an upper tolerance. So we're gonna use the tool diameter, do a little bit of math with the thread pitch, and at the end of the day, that's where we can actually end up with that lower and upper threshold through Fusion 360. I'm gonna go ahead and post these equations into the chat later on. 
But that being said is, as you can see, you can automate this process. I initially built this template in itself because one, I'm lazy or proficient, depending on if you ask Eric, my boss or my wife, but two is I wanted to be able to hand this off to somebody on the floor and not worry about it. So when they look at that print and that print says you have some 5, 16, 18 holes, this toolpath template allows them to find them automatically. Another really good handy one that I find myself using quite a bit is on a part like this, a lot of guys immediately go for the world of 2D, right? I could say 2D adaptive clearing, I could pick that lower chain, but all I'm gonna machine is this area down here. I still need to rough out the top of my tabs. I need to rough out a lot of area. I actually find myself constantly using 3D adaptive clearing over 2D. This was something that took me several months into using Fusion before I understood the difference. And the major difference I could tell you out the get-go is the 3D adaptive tool paths are much more of a hands-off kind of programming style. So for example here, any of you that haven't seen this menu, this is gonna look a little confusing at first, but my optimal load or step over, my max roughing step down, let's go ahead and say that's one times or two times deep on that tool. And then I have what's called a fine step down. So that fine step down is gonna be another step above what you're used to in 2D versus 3D. That fine step down is actually gonna go in here and create what I like to call the staircase effect on any of my 3D surfaces. So not my vertical walls and not my flats, but that being going up my actual tapers here. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay and I'm gonna let this thing calculate. While it calculates, I actually have the ability to program more in Fusion, but this actually calculated out very quick. And when I was talking about that staircase effect, as you can see here, that profile is stepping back up my part. I've also come to the realization in my experience of machining, if this is something you find yourself doing a lot of, always turn it into a template. You know, I can store this and call this my roughing cycle. I could call it half inch end mill aluminum roughing cycle. I could call it whatever I want. Again, the tool only usually goes so deep and so fast, you don't need to tweak it for something as simple as roughing. That again, allows me to create a template that allows somebody on the floor to pick up the slack on the easier parts that drive me mad. Another really quick trick that I've always found works great is to not use 2D contour, I'm gonna use 3D contour. 3D contour with the right settings here, I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys, I'm gonna turn on slope and then I'm gonna say 89.9 .9 to 90 degrees. What that just did for me is limited this tool path to only do vertical walls. That's how I cheat the system. I also need to do some things like tool outside a boundary. Last thing I may want to do is not do a helical entry. I could do a profile or a plunge based on your part. I still have that control is what is my maximum step down? Another really kind of nice thing about this tool path is with that maximum step down, it may actually calculate fewer step downs based on what is needed or even step downs as I go down my part. But as a lot of you can see, that's actually allowed me to get around that part. It's actually finishing some of my top profiles as well with little to no effort. Some of you may be looking at this right now and realizing that going into this corner could also cause chatter. This is something that I know a lot of customers tend to overlook. You have a few different options when it comes to something like this. You could actually say minimum cutter radius. And what that is gonna do is actually add a little fillet into that corner for me. But if I still need to go in there square at the end of the day, another really handy one is called feed optimization. Feed optimization will actually slow this tool down, reduce that feed rate from when we go from shouldering to that brief moment of slotting. The nice thing is with this tool path as you're gonna see here, is it actually shows up as a yellow segment versus that blue normal segment. That's where this tool path is transitioning. That's where this tool path is now slowing down and reducing that chance for surface defects. Outside of that, the last kind of tool path I showed you was that horizontal tool path. And that horizontal tool path was designed to clean up all of my walls, or not my walls, but my floors. And I like to leave stock on the walls so that I can touch those later with that contour. So you guys also probably missed a little bit of my spiel about dragging and dropping the tool paths. And also taking all of those tool paths that I'm gonna find myself using more common than not, and right-clicking and just turning those into that template. So 
I've already saved this as a template as all of you seen. That allows me to actually bring that template back in at any time and utilize that to create that pool path. From here, I went ahead and transitioned over to my dovetail stock. I know a lot of you probably saw what I was doing at the end of the day, but I'm gonna circle back to that. So in the design tab, I created a lot of different parameters that allowed me to control this stock quickly so that I can get this into a three axis machine and get those dovetails cut and not slow down to anybody that could be running the five axis or getting that first op just knocked out. So again, the nice thing is here is once you define your own parameters, you can associate those to the different dimensions in your model, and it allows you to quickly come in and change what's going on. So as you can see here, I can go through and change all of this stuff on the fly. That is gonna allow me to actually utilize that to my advantage. From here, I was making that transition into the manufacturer's section where I actually pre-programmed this part. This is the neat thing again with Fusion, and utilizing a 3D model and associating tool paths with it. This is a file that I was using day in and day out to cut dovetails. So I just quickly go in and change my parameters to the stock size. And now my probe is automatically picking up my Z axis, my X and my Y, and then cutting those two dovetail slots as I needed necessary. Again, this is a relatively simple setup using a parametric table associated with tool paths where this actually becomes very advanced at the end of the day is when we start to dig into something much more complex like a set of soft jaws. So what a lot of people will do is create a box for stock based on their part and they'll use that and then they'll work everything around that. What I like to do is start out with a parametric vice here. I'm just gonna go ahead and save this back into my actual 3X folder. And then if we go to that folder, I can drag and drop this part in. So what this is gonna do is bring my part into Fusion. And now I can have that actual clutch cover and I have my actual soft jaws and what I like to call my cheater block. So utilizing what's called a joint, which is more common in assemblies, I'm just gonna take bottom center of my part, place it on the top center of my vise. And now that that is set, I again use that parameters table to quickly control different things like the height of my jaws, the width of my jaws, even the depth of my jaws. Maybe I wanna go to two inch deep jaws. Parts looking pretty good right about there. Let's go ahead and save my actual jaw spacing. Let's bump that out to 2.5. And then lastly, I'd like to get that part down in there a quarter of an inch. As a lot of you can see, that was very fast for me to do and get that part positioned. I can now come back and use the combined command to be able to simply take one part utilizing the other and cut it. And I could have did this with both sides just so everybody's aware. But now just to get this material out of the way, using that delete key to remove those surfaces. Just like that, I created a soft jaw. You would have saw me do a combined on the other side to utilize that side as well. But the nice thing about this is if I actually place this into that part component, when I jump into the manufacturer workspace, I can actually have these pre-programmed up. In this case, I don't have any programs on that yet. So I may go ahead and say, create from template 3X mill, then turn off that actual part, and we're gonna regenerate that. And what you're gonna see is those tool paths utilized against that part. So that's the nice thing at the end of the day for visual representation, I may actually wanna go in there and utilize the floating jaw setup. Again, I can right click, go to my templates, and I'm just using that 3X basic to give you guys an idea of how to utilize that. So as you can see, I'm now roughing that out. I am going a little further than the outside of the part. So I may just need to make a couple of changes to that tool path. So we'll go in and we'll simply say, machining boundary is silhouette, tool center on boundary. And just like that, we're roughing out those pockets. Seeing how there's a silence in the chat, we're gonna go ahead and keep moving on from here. So another couple of tricks inside of Fusion 360 at the end of the day is I'm gonna go ahead and go back to this clutch cover. So I've seen a lot of times when you're doing tooling, you're doing dies, you're doing molds, you're gonna get drill holes in weird surfaces or you're gonna get things that are in the way that you're not gonna be able to utilize in the normal 
work concept. So one thing I found myself doing is I'm gonna use this for an example is I'll actually go in and let's say we wanna place a hole very awkwardly in the side of this part. So some of you may be familiar with this is it would be common if I had to machine around the outside of this part, we'll go back to manufacture real quick and see if it'll pick up on it. It didn't actually do anything there. So we're going down in that hole, we're wasting time. It could cause a lot of problems at the end of the day. Well, in the design workspace, I like to take one body and just do a control C, control V. If you're a Windows user, copy and paste. And then I turn off my original. So a workflow I see guys doing in other softwares is gonna be trying to patch this, right? Well, if I try to patch this, I get this weird sunken shape. I'm gonna do a lot of fidgeting with this at the end of the day. So I'm gonna back that up. Fusion's ability in design is actually nice because you can go into a lot of these surfaces, click them and hit delete. So what I'm gonna do is do some of these holes you can delete out of the way. I'm still in the surface environment. So let me back out of there. So when you hit delete, it can actually get rid of that whole feature. That's why I always have two parts here. So I like to call this my original or OG. And then my other one, I will usually label as modify. But this allows me at the end of the day to quickly go in and actually delete those surfaces. So I can quickly modify a part or get rid of features that I don't want by using the delete key. This allows me to remove entire features if I want, utilize those features. All that stuff is doable against what is going on. What else you also saw me do is in the manufacturer workspace is if I was to regenerate these tool paths, we're actually gonna see those go down in that hole and machine stuff out like that. So if I wanted to avoid that, I could, yes, go out and select that model right here in this body tab. However, what I actually am gonna do is in the tool path that I want to utilize this, that's where I can use what we call model. This is where I add additional models, that modified part, and that additional model allows me to bring it in for a temporary use. So it's not an all day, every day, I need that model in every tool path. I may only need that model for two or three times throughout my part. Any questions so far? So I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and... Hey, Phil, there, there are two questions. All right. Oh, there is. Yeah, um, one of them comes from David Sean. He says, does the delete feature only work for parts designed in Fusion or can you delete holes from imported parts as well? No, so that's the cool thing about that delete key is it tends to fall under what Autodesk calls direct model editing. Um, it wouldn't matter if this was a solid part, a step file, any of those formats that I bring in, I have that ability to use tools like the delete key is my favorite because you guys can see how quick I get results. But even the press pull function on a lot of those parts will actually quickly modify even a non-native fusion part. Okay, that's a great, great answer. The other question I think is gonna be a two part. Are the inspect tools and templates available in HSM for SolidWorks? So I don't believe they are because the design workspace versus the manufacturer workspace with HSM works, you're getting the tool paths. You're not necessarily getting the user interface. So if you were looking for a good reason to switch, this would actually be very helpful. Another thing I will say that if you're an HSM user and you are thinking of switching to Fusion, you can still bring your solid parts in and just how I link this part into my jig, you would actually do that same exact process with your SOLIDWORKS part. So even though this was designed in Fusion, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, I could still bring it in. I'm gonna use that file the exact same way. Okay, that makes sense. I think we could revisit that for templates. I thought there was some templates in HSM works, but they're different, but um, okay. Yeah, I let's... think that's the, the way I show it versus the way it is in HSM works, I think is different. Ah, okay. That that makes all the difference. Okay, those are the two questions we had. Awesome. So outside of that, if there is no more question that's came in, I'm gonna change gears here a little bit to something that drove me absolutely mad in the beginning. And it's one of those things that you don't realize 
there's a simple way to do it until you find it on Google or somebody else shows you is when you're doing a chain selection in the manufacturer workspace, there's probably been times where you guys go in and you try to pick a chain and this happens. I didn't get the full chain. I didn't get a section of chain. Like, how do I change that? Do I go in and do I pick the next piece normally and link that around? The issue is, is when you do stuff like this, depending on your tool path, you're gonna get a lot of segments of machining at the end of the day. Fusion's even not liking this. So how you can actually quickly change those things is once you pick the initial chain, you actually just pick that line again, allowing you to now modify that chain. So as you can see, I can actually quickly come in and pick that chain around my part and then hit the little plus sign. I'm legendary for missing that. And in this case, I misclicked. So let me go ahead and get rid of that bottom one. But you can even do things like say open versus closed chain. This chain selection is the same whether you're picking a 2D profile or if I'm in the 3D workspace, I'm gonna delete that terrible feature there. 3D contour, for example, I can actually say selected boundary. And when I go in and pick that boundary, I may need to modify that to go up and around in the same exact fashion. So the nice thing is here is that's universal between 2D and 3D for picking those tool paths. This is one that I see a lot of customers doing out the get-go that drives them mad is how do I pick that chain all the way around? It's a broken chain. How do I modify that? I even struggled with that for like the first three or four hours I was inside of Fusion. One of the last things that I'm gonna leave you all with is some of you that only do three axis work, you've never really looked at four and five, is the ease of being able to do four and five axis positional work in Fusion. I'm gonna utilize this hole right here. This hole is actually at an angle to this face. So if I wanted to do that and I had access to a five axis, I would still use my same normal tool pass at the end of the day. Let's take a 2D bore, for example. The only major difference is in the second tab of what's called tool orientation. And as soon as I turn this on, you're gonna notice this is the same as how I would select my setup inside of Fusion 360. So I'm just gonna say my Z axis is this way, and I wanna flip that because it's upside down. And now I can actually pick that bore face and do a five axis motion. So with nothing more than the standard knowledge of Fusion, a simple little checkbox is the only thing holding you back from doing three, four, five axis machine. Again, this is something that a lot of our customers tend to fear. I also know that if you are an HSM Express user, you're lacking this button as well as lacking some of these 3D features you're seeing me use. So it would be something that as your workflow changes, your parts change, or if you're just looking to quickly do an outside contour with 3D contour, it's something to start to look into maybe upgrading your HSM package. Outside of that, that was a lot of my tips and tricks that I've found that have been handy. More and more that I've done stuff in Fusion, I've seen customers where I go back to them after a couple of months, this entire actual template log that they have, they have 40, 50 plus templates. You know, they combine drilling cycles together. You know, you could do your drill, your tap, and your spot drill all wrapped into one. However, in the world of Fusion versus the HSM plugin, we actually have an extension called the machining extension that I can actually quickly do this via a template wizard. So I could go and say drill tap through, drill tap through, Fusion's already recommending me tap sizes. And just like that, I could actually generate those tool paths quickly. So again, I'm not trying to compare apples to apples or turn anyone off. The advancement with the machining extension is again, there to really make people's life easy. If you're somebody that works in the world of clamps, the ability to actually go in and say, I need to trim out where my clamp is, I can quickly come in here and drop a box, say keep tool outside of that boundary, and just like that, it trimmed that section off. These are also tips and tricks that a lot of customers love to see at the end of the day, and they tend to switch to Fusion because that's common in their workflow. A lot of this will actually apply to Inventor Cam. So a lot of people don't understand HSM works for SolidWorks and Inventor Cam is the same, and the kernel inside of Fusion is also partially HSM works.
So as you can see, a lot of the toolpath menus will look the same. Some of the other actual user interface will be different. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the CAD and CAM services that are offered by NextGen CAM. So right out the get go, as you guys can see, we offer everything from software sales to training in that software, supporting that software, and even consulting with your company to make the best software choices, workflow decisions, and getting you trained up so that you can go about that. As you can see, we can dive a little deeper into these, but the most common ones that you'll find me or being talking to me about, it will be anything from training to the support, hey, I can't select the chain right on this part, you know, what am I doing wrong? And that's where I get to email you back or do a meeting with you and tell you that it's a double click away. Outside of that post-processor editing, um, software troubleshooting, you want me to look at some new parts you're taking on to see if they're even machinable, I'm always happy to do that, and we do offer those services at NextGen Camp. So for our next training classes, what we have lined up for the month of August is we're actually going to do a best practices, and that's going to be based on the machining extension inside of Fusion. So it's going to take you through the steep and shallow tool path, tool path trimming, the delete passes, using your probe to decrease quality inspections, things of that nature. So as you can see, the label for that is, is program faster with less disaster using the machining extension. Outside of that, we're actually the following week on Monday, we're gonna offer an online training for the machining extension. So to any of you that would like to sign up for this, it's gonna be a four hour course from 11 to three Eastern Standard Time. We can provide you with a training license of Fusion with the extension already turned on to get you through that process and to see is it something that's really valuable to your company? Is it gonna actually add value or is it just gonna be something that it's just a little inconvenience that I use once a month? Can you touch on 3D adaptive machining boundaries? Yeah, let me go ahead and pull Fusion back up here. So the 3D machining boundaries are very similar to 2D at the end of the day. In short, what you're gonna utilize it as is where do you want to machine and where don't you? So you have a couple of options. One is bounding box, which if you think of that yellow square would be a bounding box of my part. That's technically the stock boundary. The silhouette of the part would be the outside boundary. It actually will, if you have through holes, it'll still machine inside those holes. And then lastly, the one that I tend to find myself using, depending on what's going on, is selection. So if I only wanted to machine, let's say around the outside of this part, as you see, I could still pick that the exact same as if I would be in 2D. The difference is, is I have the ability to say, do I want my tool inside of the boundary, center with that boundary, or do I want to be from the outside of that boundary working in? That's where I get that control at the end of the day. So I'll quickly say just center of the boundary. I'm using an adaptive clearing, so this is probably going to look a little funky. Let's go ahead and switch that out for a different tool path. Same thing applies. Select my boundary pick my contours, tool center on boundary, and I can hit okay. And what's gonna happen is, is this one is gonna actually error out because they were utilizing just vertical walls. So I may wanna say tool outside of boundary. And just like that, you'll see it'll actually come around the outside of that part. In this case, it's giving me an error message because it can't fit that tool into certain areas, but that's how you can go about that selection. Another way that I find myself using it is if I create a new setup and we flip this part over, I only want a machine inside the pocket. That being said, 3D adaptive clearing, I want to do a selected boundary here, and I want to stay tool inside a boundary. So that's where I'm going to utilize those selection boundaries versus everything else. We machine this from one face going through, so we did that adaptive clearing all the way to the outside. I don't need to waste my time with that tool outside of the pocket. Ryan, does that help a little bit? Or I can always reach out after this meeting and we can dive a little deeper into that. Okay. Yeah, I've got definitely his name down here. So we can reach back to Ryan and go over that in more detail. Another question came in, uh, Ryan did say thank you, from Gary Cummings. He's saying, can you do a quick summary of the machining extension that you mentioned? And I, I guess the best answer to that is attend the next webinar in August, but maybe you can just go over some of the bullets again. Yeah, I mean, to touch basis on it real quickly is if you're in Fusion itself, 
you could actually go up to the extension plugin here and you could go to machining and this is going to list off all of those things that are actually in the machining extension so some of the stuff that you get is if you're a five axis kind of guy you get the collision avoidance you get additional controls for tool orientation but outside of that if you have a probe this is where the real power starts to show through so if you've ever had to tram your part into the machine it takes some time part alignment allows you to probe it where it lies adjust your program accordingly the whole recognition feature you guys saw me use that a little bit on the clutch cover um, even things like the delete and the toolpath trimming toolpath trimming is what you saw me cut away the part at the end of the day not the part itself but the toolpath just to change where maybe a clamp was or to quickly modify what's going on so this isn't an extension of fusion 360 so some of these things the steep and shallow toolpath is a big part of the power mill starting to come into fusion 